Good afternoon and welcome to our Stunted Children, a special webinar presented by Fair Play in partnership with Food from Zanzi. My name is Dawn Numdu. I head up audience and engagement at South Africa's leading digital agricultural news and lifestyle platform. And joining me is my co-host this afternoon, uh, Food from Zanzi co-founder Ivor Price. Thank you, Dawn. Good afternoon and a big welcome to everybody joining us on this webinar here on Zoom. I see some people still trickling in, but we are live on various platforms, also on Fair Play's social media channels, as well as a good afternoon to Food from Zansi readers who are tuning in live from our Food from Zansi website, our Facebook page, as well as YouTube. Um, in other words, people are participating this afternoon from various channels. This afternoon, we will engage on an issue that is often swept under the map. We'll be looking at the causes as well as the impact of child stunting on our society, as well as interventions to eradicate the dawn. Now, joining us this afternoon, as you can see, I'm not alone. We have uh, three thought leaders who will discuss the critical and urgent topic of child stunting in South Africa. And as you know, child stunting is a preventable condition that lasts a lifetime. Um, it affects the well being of the entire country, and an estimated 27% of South African children are stunted. And when you mention figures like 27%, Dawn, I wonder how can this be when we as a nation like to proclaim that we are food secure? But let's introduce our panel of experts. First up, he's a man who needs very little introduction. He's one of the most prominent voices and activists in the world of agriculture, Francois Bird, the founder of the Fair Play movement. He believes that chicken dumping kills jobs. It creates poverty, which is the root cause of malnutrition. Thank you for joining us, Francois. Um, good morning to you. It's about what, um, 5 a.m. there, 4 a.m.? Good morning. Well, not 5 a.m., but 7 a.m., which is close enough. Thank you. Looking forward to your contribution this afternoon, Francois. And our two experts this afternoon are people that we greatly admire at Food from Zanzi and the Fair Play Movement. They are Dr. Kupani Mabaso. Um, she is the executive director at, Grow, at the Grow Great campaign. And she will be asking whether South Africa is on track to eliminate child stunting uh, by 2030 and introduce us to some of the initiatives which have been undertaken in South Africa thus far. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Mabasu. Thank you for having me, lovely to be here. We're also very honored to welcome Dr. Mark Wegerev. He's a lecturer in development studies at the University of Pretoria, and his research focuses on agrarian transformation and food system. Um, great to have you with us as well, Dr. Wegerev. Thanks for having me, and you can call me Mark. <laughs> That's Thank easier. <laughs> Thank you. We're looking forward to a very interactive discussion. Uh, we promise, we promise we won't bore you um, to death by PowerPoint today. Um, and if you are joining us via Zoom, uh, please use the option, you can, chat, you can chat to us as well. There's an option to post your questions and statements to all of our panelists and any of them. Um, please just uh, write their name or direct it to a specific panelist. Um, of the, uh, in, the, in, in that platform. And if you are joining us via one of Food from Zanzi's platforms, please comment on Facebook. Um, you can simply tag Food from Zanzi and Fair Play on Twitter as well. Okay, so let's kick off today's uh, conversation. Uh, I now give over to Francois Bird, the founder of the Fair Play movement. Thank you, Dawn. Well, it's, it's high time to have this conversation and people may well say, why would Fair Play as a trade activists, uh, be so concerned about child stunting, which is normally seen as a health problem. I wouldn't have been able to make this connection when we first started out on the fair play journey four years ago. But you know what struck me then and what motivated us to start fair play was when we saw the devastation caused by poultry operations in rural areas closing down. And when we realized that they closed down because chicken is dumped in South Africa by international operators selling it below the price of local production or the local market price, 
not really passing on the full benefit to local uh, consumers, but making sure that it's just below the local competitive price of producers. And you know who went to the wall first? Small farmers and those people whose jobs were on the lowest rung of the job ladder. And they lost their jobs. And this is mostly in rural areas where unemployment is much higher than the national average of 30% now. And all the negative indicators increased when that happened. So we started on this journey of fighting for uh, a better uh, trade regime being exercised to stop dumping. Little did I know then, as I know now after being educated by, by people like uh, Dr. Mabasu and, and, and Dr. Vierhoff that in fact, the social cost of dumping is children whose lives are destroyed forever by stunting. And the worst is, it's a condition that can be prevented, but is very rarely cured. And that just grabs my heart. I just don't know how we allow that. So for me, this is a major national shame but it's not yet a national focus. And my hope is that today that starts changing around because tomorrow is World Children's Day. And I would really not like to listen to all the pious statements by important people about how important children are for the future unless we solve stunting. So I thank you, Food from Zanzi, Ivor and Dawn. I thank you, Dr. Mabasu and Dr. Vierhoff for joining us today to hopefully trigger some dormant feeling in the national conscience that we should do something about this. And I believe the outcome of this might be that we can show the way, what should be done. And I hope that's what we get to. And Franca, I'm hoping that it will be more than a, a national conversation. This is a national emergency. Every yeah. child should matter in this country. Dr. Cupano, Maybe as a way of introduction, just sketch how big the problem of stunting is in South Africa. Sure, sure, Ivo. So thanks once again um, for having me. And, and perhaps even just to take a step back and share a little bit about who we are as Growgrate and, and why we do what we do. So we're a campaign with the aim to galvanize South Africa towards a national commitment to zero stunting by 2030. We launched in mid-2018 in response to the South African Demographic Health Survey that's shown that stunting in South Africa has persisted at the same high levels that it's at now for at least the last two, two decades. And as many of you will already be aware that this is a condition that results in children being excessively, excessively short for their age as, as a result of prolonged undernutrition and pregnancy in the early years of life. And, and why it's important, I mean, we don't care so much about height, but what we do care about is that this impairs not only the physical development of children, but their brain development as well, which is a gross wastage of precious human capital. So to answer your question, um, Ivo, I mean, I think Dawn alluded to it, that we've got as many as one in four children under five who are stunted in South Africa, and as many as one in three in the lower income quint quintiles. And this is far higher than one would expect for an upper middle income country such as ours and far higher than many of our developing country counterparts. And it's of grave concern because stunting has long-term consequences for children's health, education and economic prospects across the life course. Stunted children perform worse at school than their non-stunted counterparts. They're less likely to finish school. They're more likely to live in poverty and unemployment as adults. They are at increased risk of chronic diseases like diabetes and heart disease and hypertension in adulthood and on average have lower life expectancies than non-stunted children. And bearing in mind that I think both Dawn and Francois have iterated that for the most part stunting is preventable. So it's not just um, that we've allowed it to persist and continue to allow it to persist at such high levels because essentially stunting is shortchanging the next generation's chances their capacity to learn, and it undermines their ability to obtain jobs and fully participate in the country's economy. It also leaves them in worse health, robbing them of a full and productive life and placing further burden 
on an already fragile health system and overstretched state services. And what's worse is that it's affecting our country's poorest communities most severely, threatening to widen the divides that have, been character that have become characteristic of South African life and trapping families in intergenerational cycles of poverty because stunted mothers um, are more likely to have stunted children. The good news though, is that it can be beaten. And so what I look forward to today, Ivor and Dawn is discussing with yourselves, as well as with Mark and Franca, how we together can get South Africa on the path to zero. Dr. Wegerif, Mark, maybe we, we can engage you at this point. Um, if stunting has become chronic in South Africa, and that's the norm, um, that makes it much more difficult to address. What's the first and most important step that we should be taking um, at this point in time? Well, first, let's be clear, it is a chronic problem. And that's one of the reasons why it's hard to deal with. It's not a new thing. It's been with us uh, for as long as we've ever been major measuring such things. And in fact, we had in the country made progress in reducing you know, the proportion of children who are stunted. But the real concern at the moment for me is that not only is the level very high, the latest credible figures we have say 27.4%, which I think was a 2018 figure. Um, but worrying is that that was higher than the 2012 figure we had, which was 27.2%. Not much higher, but higher, which means we're going the wrong direction. And if we look also at the increasing levels of food insecurity, we can anticipate that in the coming years, the, the number and the proportion of children stunted is also going to be getting higher. Um, the, the one of the, well, just, to, just to add one thing for me that was shocking on what Dr. Mavasa was saying in terms of the impacts, there is also an emotional and psychological development impact of stunting and including um, a reduction of impulse control of people who are stunted as children. So it's very credible to link also even our high levels of violence and gender violence to stunting. You know? It doesn't mean that every child that was stunted is going to be <laughs> violent, but it does just as stunting decreases other cognitive abilities, it also decreases things like impulse control and therefore can contribute to things like gender violence. So it's really serious, but it's hard to see it as serious. We get used to it. You know, in poor neighborhoods, all the children are the same size, they're all a bit short. We only comment when there's the bigger, fatter baby and say, oh, that's a big baby. When in fact, you know, for, we, we know medically and so on that, that that larger baby is what all the babies should be if they were and their mothers were getting the right nutrition. So drawing attention to it, giving it the urgency is a great challenge. So we definitely have to increase awareness and we have to make people realize this is a problem and that it can be addressed. But also I think there are no easy solutions. There's no one, easy solution. We should take whatever quick steps we can, but I would argue for a systemic approach that has to really transform the food system. You know, and so we, I just we want to outline a little bit, you know, this what, what we mean by food security and the dimensions of that, because for me, that's important for us to understand in, in seeing why we need a food system kind of approach. And I want to also challenge this idea that goes around that Ivor mentioned that we as a nation are food secure. I mean, the, the land, the geographic area of South Africa doesn't eat food. It's the people in South Africa that need to be food secure. And the only measure of whether we're food secure or not must be whether our people are food secure. And that means, according to all the widely agreed definitions, a situation that exists when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutrition, nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and a healthy lifestyle. And that involves uh, four main dimensions. We need food availability, we need accessibility, we need utilization, and we need also stability of supply. So accessibility is the food is there on the shelves, and indeed food is there. The quality of it is an issue sometimes, but the food is there. <clears throat> the first big challenge we have is accessibility, that people go hungry in South Africa because they can't afford to buy the food. It's there, but they can't get that food. And that's where, when we look at the food system approach, just delivering cheap food is not solving the problem if you're putting people out of work, um, et cetera, and therefore creating greater hunger. Utilization is very important, and Dr. Mavas will probably know more about that, but you know, the food being in the home doesn't mean everyone eats equally, the gender uh, discrimination and dynamics to that. And also a child who is sick uh, is not biologically able to absorb all the nutrition from the food. So there are children who eat enough food but don't get the nutrition outcomes 
because of health. And that's where you have to combine it with healthcare interventions. And then stability is critical because we have to be able to survive shocks and we have to think of the future. We can't, for a sustainable food system, we can't have a food system that feeds us today, but at the expense of the next generation because we degrade soils or we drive climate change, et cetera. So we need a systemic approach. And yes, we want the quickest fixes we can, but we also have to take a longer term view and we have to address a range of factors holistically if we're gonna have a sustainable solution for this generation and for the coming generations. That's actually a refrain we've been hearing throughout the COVID-19 lockdown in South Africa. I think the veil has been lifted. Um, we can no longer just assume that we are a food secure nation because all the evidence Francois is pointing to the contrary. Um, the food system is beyond broken. Just maybe a tiny step back for, for some of the people joining us on all the different platforms. What exactly do we mean when we talk about stunting? Stunting is when a child is simply too short for his or her age. Um, and that represents much more than just growth failure. And I've been reading up on some of the research published in some medical journals, journals including The Lancet. And it says during the first thousand days of life, um, spanning the period from initial stage of pregnancy to a child's second birthday, nutritional deficits can irreversibly damage health, growth, and development. And Francois, at the Fair Play Movement, you linking that directly, as you said in the beginning, to, to dumping. Well, dumping is a form of predatory trade. And of course, uh, particularly the importers who make fat profits off uh, the, uh, the predatory trade practices deny that it's happening. But many countries have already been found guilty of dumping in South Africa over the last 10 years. And I've no doubt that more will be if we have the means to bring all the legal actions that are necessary. But just as the food system is broken, the trade system is broken too. Because if you look at the World Trade Organization, it's as fast as molasses. So the problem is not a lack of protein in in the country, it's access to that protein, and Mark. And, and, and Kupanu, that, that's really an issue for, for fighting stunting, correct? Is access to protein, access to the right foods uh, at the right age. And also for the parents of, the, of children to have the right foods. It's not only about feeding the children, it's about feeding the parents. And so if we want to take a systemic approach to solving the problem, we also have to fix the trade problem. We can't have small farmers going out of business so that they're unable to feed local children and local parents. Uh, we can't have uh, those at the lower ends of the jobs uh, uh, ladder uh, having no income, uh, being unable to feed themselves and their children. So this is about jobs, it's about employment. Uh, these things are all linked, and that's the point we at Fair Play like to make, is let's make the linkages, but more importantly, you know, stunting has both an I and a U. We all have to work together to solve this problem. We can't stand aside, and even if you're an importer who's made millions, and good for you, you've now done your damage, uh, but people should start putting money into helping children to get the right food and helping their parents to get the right food. But most importantly, we all have to make sure that we create employment and protect employment in South Africa. It's an I and uh, I was no, just going to come and respond yeah. as well, but is it Dawn? No, no, you, you can go ahead, Dr. Mechera. <laughs> Sure. No, I was, I was just, I, I've sort of lost my train of thought now, but I, I was just going to say that, I mean, one, one of the things is that when we're talking about uh, the parents being fed, I think we, we have to be clear that we need a particular focus on women being fed and women having adequate nutrition and healthy lifestyles. And what we see is a continuing discrimination against women. So one place to start would be, you know, I don't want to say empowering women. It's more, how do we end the discrimination that women continue to face? And because it's the, the healthy and well-nourished mother that will give birth to the healthy and well-nourished well child and avoid stunting. You know, the, the stunting starts in the womb when the mother is not nourished enough to, to give adequate nutrition to the child even before the child is born. Uh, and what we've seen is that women are 
you know, well, it's been revealed very clearly by COVID, we knew it already, but there was the NIDSCRAM report that showed that of 3 million jobs lost in the first months of the lockdown, 2 million of those were women. And that's because women are in the bottom of the rung. And even in agriculture, they're often the smallest farmers and the most vulnerable, or when they're employees, they're often the most underpaid and most vulnerable employees, earning too little to be able to feed their children adequately, even when they're working full time, growing food in agriculture. So we have to yeah, focus on women, would be one of my appeals. And certainly we're gonna, we have to protect the South African agricultural sector and its job creation potential from you know, just unequal world trade, you know, the dumping the, uh, and so on. We can't, we, we can't be expecting farmers to compete with subsidized agriculture in other countries or other countries that simply benefit from low exchange rates, something as arbitrary as that. You know, because China's exchange rate is low, it doesn't mean our farmers are not working efficiently, so they shouldn't have to compete with that. And the problem when we try and compete with that is that the farmer themselves is also forced to push down on workers and pay them wages, which even at the minimum wage don't buy adequate nutrition, as we've seen. And often that is also women at that end. So we need a viable, vibrant agricultural sector that can, can maximize jobs. And instead of losing jobs, we've lost hundreds of thousands of jobs, not only in the chicken industry, but hundreds of thousands of jobs across the agricultural sector in the last 20 years. That's hundreds of thousands more people going hungry, uh, their children being stunted. You make it Don't I find it absolutely... Uh, sorry, uh, sorry. I'm, I'm picking up on no. a point there. You make some good... Mark, you make a very good point, which is the whole value chain of, of food. Because, you know, <laughs> I, I realized early on that Brazilian chickens don't eat South African maize. And so even uh, like the poultry industry is one of the most competitive in the world, so they can compete. It's not about being competitive. It's subsidies and other forms of, of pernicious trade that becomes predatory. And you, you look at Ghana, for instance, and in Ghana, a chicken is now as expensive almost as steak is in South Africa. And it's because the local industry has been wiped out. Uh, and I just think if we get back to what are the things we need to do, both short term and long term. So yes, we have to change the system. But uh, Kwani, you made you you made a very good point that it's preventative. How do we? How do you actually, as a as a family, prevent malnutrition in a child? Um, sure, that's yeah. bothering me since yesterday. Yeah. Look, I mean, you know, the burden of preventing it really would be unfair to place that on a poor household. And so it, it does require a whole of society response. And if you look at countries that have, and they are, you know, they are, Senegal has done really well, Ghana, Chile, Peru, Brazil. So we're not talking about your high income countries. We're talking about countries that are battling with HIV, battling with unemployment, battling with similar challenges to us, but have managed to get on top of this. And what they have in common is they have this focus on women of reproductive age. Yeah. So as well as children, you know, in the early years. So what you call your first thousand days from conception to age two. There's also high political prioritization and leadership around this issue, which we don't see sufficient of that in South Africa. And then there's this cross-sectional um, response because, you, I mean, as we've said, we're talking about food here. We're talking about healthy environments because it's one thing for children to be eating good food, but if they don't have water and sanitation, they're having repeated bouts of diarrhea. They are unwell. They cannot retain those nutrients. And then you need care. You need immunizations to protect you from illnesses. You need deworming to protect you from parasitic infestations that make it difficult for your body to retain. So all of these domains need to work together, but they sit in different departments. And so countries who've effectively reduced stunting have had the sitting at the highest level of office and, and, and coordinated, so targeted, focused, and coordinated, um, looking at the same operational metrics and reporting on them. So when we say preventable, we mean that, you know, I mean, we think of um, just the, the child support grant, right? We're doing really well. I mean, it's well targeted and it makes the difference, but we're missing pregnancy, which is really where, you know, women need it the most. I mean, we've got about a 29, um, 19 stats, about 15% of children who were born with a low birth weight, meaning that they were born under 2.5 kgs. And that's a, a major risk factor for stunting. Food insecurity in pregnancy also puts women at risk of poor mental health. And that becomes a vicious cycle because if you're depressed and anxious, 
you can't work, you can't find work, you, you yourself don't respond to cues from the baby. And so you've got this vicious cycle of food insecurity also um, fueling other chronic conditions. And so, you know, if we were just to extend, for example, an existing policy, add a nine months earlier to an 18 year program, it's a little bit of money, but it's a huge investment. And I mean, we, you know, we know the Heckman curve that if you invest in the first couple of years of life, your returns on investment are huge. So as a country, we need to have a long-term view, but also act on things that leave, start to pull the levers that are easy to pull in the short term. Um, because take the lockdown, they estimate about 300,000 babies born during that time into an environment of high unemployment, um, unemployed mothers, food insecurity, um, and so we need to both be identifying what are the downstream things we can do quite quickly and what are the more upstream longer term system changes that we need to be working on in parallel and it shouldn't be either or because we won't shift the needle on stunting if we don't start working on both. Um, it was quite interesting or fascinating to hear Dr. Becherov talk about or sort of speak about the links between dumping and stunting from an agrarian academic perspective. Um, but Dr. Mabaso, if we can stay with you for a moment, maybe we can just pinpoint some of the causes of stunting um, before we go further. And then also why we haven't found affordable permanent solutions for this. Um, what you, you just alluded to that a moment ago, that yeah. it should actually start way before and, and it, they would be, it would have a much longer term impact. So, yeah. so maybe you can yeah. just touch on sure. that. So, I mean, some, some, some evidence or data from, you know, countries where they've looked at kind of what are the combination of factors that make children really um, vulnerable. And so there's this sort of dyad of food, healthy environments and care. So food, both quantity, so you need to have enough food, but also diversity. And according to the 2016 South African Demographic Health Survey, only 23% of children between six and 23 months are eating a minimally acceptable diet. So that's already telling you, you know, what, what Mark was alluding to earlier, that we have food, but children who are transitioning from breast milk to the family meal, which is a very vulnerable period for children, so that's six to 23 months, only 23% of them are having a minimally acceptable diet. And if you look at the score for that diet, it's not salmon and sushi. It's your very basic foods that should be available to an, you know, a normal family in a normal society that protects its vulnerable. So there's the food diversity and quantity. Then, as I mentioned, there's the healthy environment. So you need water. And we saw that in, in, with COVID. We don't have, communities don't have, many communities don't have access to water. In fact, you need sanitation, right? So you need to be able to, to um, relieve yourself in a clean and safe way. And about a fifth of children live in households that don't even have a ventilated um, pit latrine. So, I mean, the bar for adequate sanitation is quite low. So already mom can be doing her absolute best with a grant, but if she's not able to wash her hands, if she's not able to, to keep the environment safe, that baby's gonna have multiple bouts of diarrhea. And then you need care. So you need a baby to get the very basic package of primary health care that around the world is standard. So your immunizations, your deworming, in pregnancy, your iron and folate supplementation and breastfeeding support. So although we offer it in the health system, there's lots of barriers to access. So there's the opportunity cost to go to the clinic. Women need to pay for a taxi fare. If you're a farm worker, that's not a really easy thing to negotiate, right? And then there's um, those first thousand days when children are not in institutions, they're not in the ECD center and they're not at school. So all our programs start at that point. They start feeding children in ECD centers. They start feeding children in grade R. But in the first thousand days, you've got mom and baby, sometimes teenage mom, unemployed, poor, depressed, anxious mom, alone with baby in the home. And so we have this workforce that we're really not leveraging, the community healthcare workers who are in communities going into homes, but are still doing your sort of old HIV, TB, things that we were necessary at a time, but actually we've got this workforce that should be pivoted to be if they encounter a child in the home, should be opening the clinic card and saying, hey, this baby's not growing well, mommy. Oh, you missed this appointment, mom. So there's some really basic things in the health system as South African, we can do better. And when you look at other countries, you know, we do offer free primary health care. We've endorsed all the possible WHO, everything. We've signed it, we've agreed to it, but it's in the implementation. You know, I, I think South Africa, we know that we've got 
policies that give you goosebumps, they are so well written. But actually, what, what does that policy translate to for a family in Nkomaz in Pumalanga, that's a different story. So I think we really need to start focusing on not just funding lots of consultants to write great policies, but actually tracking what happens in communities and measuring it over time. So if you've just joined us, um, good afternoon. Welcome to the Fair Play and Food from Zansi webinar on the eve of National Children's Day. We're talking about um, child stunting in South Africa. It's an issue so often swept under the map. We've got people joining us on Zoom right now, but also um, on YouTube, on the Fair Play social media channels, Food from Zansi's website, as well as the um, Food, Food, um, Food from Zansi social um, platforms. Our panelists this afternoon are Dr. Kupana Mabasu, Dr. Mark Viegeref, and Francois Bird from the Fair Play Movement. And I'm burning to ask Francois another question, but if you will indulge me for a moment, Mark, um, I'm seeing some of the tweets coming in. The big issue, um, possibly one of the biggest 2020 issues besides COVID-19, has been land. Um, uh, land reform, land re de redistribution in South Africa. Do you see this program aiding or hindering food security in South Africa? And what role, if any, will um, land redistribution play in addressing stunting and, and malnutrition? Well, certainly the current program we have is not very effective. Uh, so it's not going to play a big role, but the potential for far reaching land and agrarian reform to play a role is there, if we can get it right. And I think we do have to get it right. We have to get it right from a justice point of view, but also because restructured land relations can be the basis and they will be an essential part of a much more equitable food system and more equitable economy. So we do need to try and get it right and we can get it right. The way that it will impact positively on agriculture on food production and then through that on child stunting will be if we can integrate land reform with wider food system transformation. One of the weaknesses I think of our land reform program in South Africa is that we think we can distribute land without changing the nature of power relations in the markets in who controls the processing and the distribution and so on. And I must say, I mean, that that is partly about how we manage our uh, place in the global economy, the concerns that Francois and Fair Play have with, with dumping and so on. But we also have to look within South Africa and we have a highly unequal system where a smaller and smaller number of large producers are capturing most of the value of production and most of the market space. So there's even aside from the dumping question, we have small farmers being pushed out of business and very little opportunity for new black farmers coming in to succeed uh, because of the high level of inequality and concentration, not only in land ownership, but also in production. So we see <clears throat> we have over two and a half million people in South Africa who farm. You know, let's not keep this division of commercial farmers this side where we're basically white farmers and then black farmers in the homelands or some other group. Let's look at all our farmers. There's more than two and a half million people who farm, but only about 7,000 of those farms produce over 80% of the agricultural value. And this is now increasingly, these are companies, not even what we would call a farmer. We can see something like a company like Future Growth. It's an investment firm. It's invested over 400 million Rand in eight farms spread across the country to diversify risk. They outsource production to production operation companies. They have over 4,000 workers, but 85% of them are, temp are seasonal workers. So most of the year they have no income and that's when their children are going hungry, you know? So, and so they are getting economies of scale, which maybe enable them to compete in the global economy, but we're not, they're not creating secure jobs. They're not creating the knock-on effects of more multipliers through processing and local markets in the local economy. So we, we need land reform, we need agrarian reform, but we need to integrate that with a wider food system transformation. Uh, maybe the last point I'll say on that is just, you know, we, will not, we, we can't succeed in this by just trying to reduce the price of food. Farmers need to also get fair prices for their food. But what we have to look at is where does the money we pay for the food go? And it's very clear that at the moment, some big processing companies and the big supermarket groups are capturing an unreasonable proportion of the value. It's not value that's going to the farmer. Um, it's, it's value that's being captured often by foreign owned or large corporate owned uh, companies and, and supermarket groups. I think that's something we have to address so that more value can go to the farmer and 
the buyer can get, <coughs> you know, gets a reasonable price as well. Ivo, if I may, Dawn, if I may just uh, ask something, because it, it really, you know, every time I listen to, to, to Dr. Vesheref and Dr. Mabasu, I learn something new. And, and the thing I've just learned is how much policy is in place and how little execution is taking place. And my question is, how, how do we get that trigger pulled? Uh, do you ha I mean, Ivor, do you have any ideas on how we, we can work together to get, uh, to get that trigger pulled on action? That's a, that's a very good question and, and links with one of the questions, um, Dawn, that I saw coming in on the Facebook page of Food from Zanzi, Simone, saying, um, who's responsible for nutrition education to the society? Um, you know, we've got the policies in place, um, but where does the buck stop? Why is this happening? Why are 27% of kids then stunted? Let's, let's see what the experts say. Dr. Kupana? Yeah, I mean, look, you know, I think we, we often look to government as sort of the, the sole and only responsible one. And I think government can do better in, in many areas. But I think there's also a lot we can do in communities as well. Um, so, I mean, I take, for example, that our labor law makes provision for women to take two 30 minute breastfeeding breaks in the workplace. Few employers, I mean, there was a survey done, even some of the sort of rights-based organizations, few employers are even aware, right? And so this is not part of even HR policies. And, you know, it's often said that if breastfeeding was a product discovered today, it would win both the Nobel Prize for medicine or science and for economics. It's both an economic intervention and a health intervention. Um, you know, there's a Lancet paper that suggests that babies who are exclusively breastfed have higher IQs because breastfeeding is so protective, um, both against the gut in terms of, you know, in terms of gut health, but also in terms of brain development. Now, you know, we often are unfair to moms. We, you know, 32% of women in South Africa breastfeed exclusively to six months, but do we create enabling systems, you know, we talk about women's rights, do we as employers ensure that women can breastfeed, that they support it, that they can take paid maternity leave. So there's a lot that civil society and private sector can do. But in terms of government, absolutely, we need, you know, as I said, we've got lots of fancy policies. And I think this is not just to do with health, it's across South Africa, but we struggle with implementation. And I think holding our leadership accountable. Um, I mean, and we've done this before, right? I mean, the sort of pre-ARV fights, you know, in South Africa are an example of how us as South Africans can come behind something that we know needs to be done and can, and can, can keep our foot and pressure on that so that it does happen. And I think stunting is calling for us to do something similar. Yeah, I think Dr. Mabasu, as a new mom and, and someone that also came through the system, I am with you on that point, the support and the engagement, there's not enough. Um, so, so, so I'd like to go to Dr. Becher if we, we are engaging on Zoom as well. So this question came from Michael. Uh, Michael is asking you, Dr. Becher, um, do we have policies on food fortification? And again, would you say that the school feeding schemes or programs comes late too late in the day? Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think I just answered him on the chat line as well, but I'll answer for everyone who might not be following that. That yes, there are policies on fortification. So we do see vitamin fortification of most of our maize, etc., which is positive and it's it's worth doing. Um, and we should continue that and broaden that. But I don't think fortification can ever replace the balanced diet that, that Kopana was talking about. Because a diet is a very complex thing. You know, we need the fibers and so on in our diet to help our digestion, to get you know, the, all the nutrients out of the food, et cetera. So fortification, yes, great. And it's being done to some extent, uh, but it doesn't replace the need for a balanced diet, which must include fresh fruit, fresh, fresh vegetables, and so on. And yes, the NSNP does come too late for stunting. We measure stunting uh, for five-year-olds. So the 27.4% figure is 27.4%. <clears throat> More than one in four of our five-year-olds are stunted. Of course, those five-year-olds haven't started school yet. But I do want to say, and you know, I've been hearing you know, the talk about the implementation challenges. I do think the NSNP, the National School Nutrition Program, is a fantastic program. You know, we f the government feeds nine million children every day. And just last week, I, I went to some schools in Mabupani and Shoshenguve, and I saw 
children eating. And I was also struck that we had the, the COVID brigades were there and they were helping to maintain social distancing and have these small children, including the grade R's and so on, line up with social distancing, get their food and so on. You know, it's, it's quite impressive, you know, and I think we should kind of embrace where some things do work, you know, uh, and we should absolutely carry on with that. We can do more with it to help support black farmers and use that purchasing power to help transform the food system. That's like another debate. But yes, it's too late for stunting. So we need interventions that start from when the woman is pregnant. And this is where I like Copano's suggestions, which I mean, extend the child grant to the, the pregnant mother. And we, we need that gap right from conception. And in fact, preconception, because, and this is where I said earlier, I want to repeat it again, we need women in society to be healthy and well nourished. And, you know, and that will um, lead be a big contribution to to reducing stunting. So we need those interventions. I think Compano mentioned good ideas of extending the grant, making sure you know feeding uh, and so on goes also into early childhood centres and beyond those. And we need a more coordinated approach to that. You know, and one of the problems we have in South Africa, there are good bits happening. The grants have made a big difference. The NSNP is a good program, um, <clears throat> but it's bits and there are gaps in it. And what we don't have is that coordinated view. We had this um, nutrition, food, food and nutrition security policy passed in 2013, but there's very little implementation of that. That talked about things like, I think they called it a council, a food security council or something, which hasn't been established. It talked about the need for new legislation, which would give effect to the right to food in our constitution that hasn't been passed. Um, so there are clear gaps at that level. But there are th things we can do. But I think uh, there was a question earlier around sort of the change and resistance to change. The challenges and where we get resistance is when we talk about, you know, challenging vested economic interests and where we want a greater transformation that would change where value in the food system goes and where we need more democratization of the food system that is currently far too much controlled by a few vested interests. Uh, that's where the change is difficult, but we need that change as well alongside these other government interventions. I think the uh, the issue is is really that we it seems to me we we need a, a sort of a, a national emergency task force to to really get things going because unless we get that going uh, nothing else happens I mean it's no there's no point extending feeding programs uh, to to expectant mothers if we still have value added tax on chicken. You know, uh, we need to, we need a, a sort of an inter, a, a, a national task force to end child stunting, and they must they must do what must be done. Uh, and uh, if I understand it correctly, our constitution actually demands this. So if we if if we don't do it, it's unconstitutional. So if we're saying, Dawn, that child stunting is a national emergency. Um, and, and many of our consumers, um, um, people participating in this webinar are saying uh, the prices of food as well is a national emergency. Dawn, I see a question came in from Sandile Dlamini. Yeah, Sandile Dlamini is saying, I've noticed the price of food has increased exponentially over the past year. Uh, nutritious choices are really expensive. Um, vegetable prices have gone up. Chicken prices have gone up dramatically. Um, and He's asking, is there a intervention that can be made up made to keep prices level for access? Franco, maybe you'd like to, to, to come in here. Well, I think the, uh, the issue is that we should do everything possible to support uh, small scale farmers, uh, the, 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 in, the farming industries as well should, uh, should coordinate uh, because, as I said, you know, South African chickens eat South African maize. So if the maize price goes up, everything else goes up with it. Now, we're not, we're not saying at Fair Play that we must stop the market because we want to get off. Uh, we believe market forces should pay, play a role. But that's why I believe a, a national task force must be started to make sure that vulnerable people or potentially vulnerable people like expectant mothers and small children uh, are taken care of in time through everything that's available to us, every lever that's available to us. You know, if our country 
could step up to the plate and deliver a soccer World Cup or a rugby World Cup or a cricket World Cup that's of international standard, uh, why can't we rather step up to the plate mm -hmm. and end mm -hmm. child stunting? And for me, that would be a thing that will get me far more enthusiastic <laughs> because those children might one day become sports stars, but it's going to be important for us to, to do short and long term uh, everything from, from food gardens. I, I've seen such wonderful stories about people making food gardens on their pavements so that anyone could have mm. access. Now, the, this is not something we need to wait for the government to happen. Uh, everyone can do that. There's not, not, nothing stopping anyone from doing it. But we really need to do the big important things that must be done today for children to have a tomorrow. And so I, I, I think we need that national task force to, to end this problem. Absolutely, Ivo, if I may. Yes, I was add. just going to say, I'm sorry, Dr. Kapan, I was just going to say, um, we've been asking about what should be done in the National Task Force, perhaps is right. one of the answers, but a lot has been done and I know Grow Great has been highly active in this field, Dr. Kapana. Tell us about some of your achievements because um, you've been doing quite a bit. And how do you sure, feel no, about a National yeah. Task Force? Yeah, look, I mean, I agree. And I was going to say that even if the moral sort of, uh, you know, pull at your conscious argument doesn't, doesn't work for some. The economic argument itself is very compelling. You know, I mean, I think there's a lot that has been done um, both globally, but even locally around just the cost of, of having such a high burden of stunting um, to a country. You know, I think the World Bank estimates that uh, countries in Africa and Asia with high levels of stunting similar to ours are losing eight to 11% of GDP. And we know we can't afford that, right? Um, and just even from a human capital point of view, we talk about being a fourth industrial revolution nation, smart cities, you know, and none of that, you know, we can't realize that if we have a quarter of our children whose capacity to learn is undermined even before they get to school. I mean, there's some interesting local studies that look at reading speed and compare the speed of a child who's stunted to a child who's not. I mean, this is recent studies and it's heartbreaking to watch just how these children struggle. So all the interventions we layer on from ECD centers onwards, we're almost throwing money into a sieve, you know, because we, we really need to get the foundation right. So, I mean, to, to speak about our own work, I mean, really primarily we're a campaign to, you know, create awareness and to galvanize a national commitment. So something certainly is not going to be resolved by Grow Great alone, but we are putting our sort of money where our mouths are and trying to demonstrate what you can do if you actually implement some of these really good policies. So in certain provinces, we partner with provincial governments to support community healthcare workers, to train them, to support them, to equip them, to skill them and to give them feedback because I think community healthcare workers have, you know, we, we use them. I mean, you look at COVID, suddenly they all sort of, you know, contracts are being renewed quickly and they're screening and then they, they sort of sent back to kind of this job insecurity that they were in before. When actually this is a, a, a workforce that is trusted by the communities that is entering homes that can play a huge difference. So in Pumalanga and Limpopo, we've got good relationships with those provincial, provincial departments of health and are working with a significant number of their community health workforce to demonstrate what you can achieve. We also know that, you know, our health system is strained, right? And we, we can't pretend about that. I mean, we saw that in COVID, we, you know, we, we know that the tension between private health sector and public and how many of our health workforce are sitting in private health sector. And so the public system is strained. And so we can, we can complain and complain about that nurses and doctors are not doing enough, or we can try and, and, and introduce community-based interventions that augment that. And so we run a social franchise. So it's a micro enterprise for women, women who themselves live in communities who understand the challenges. So these are mothers, what you call your positive deviants, women who are sitting with the same set of conditions, but have managed to raise healthy children, have managed to overcome. So they really understand how to hustle and work their system. And we train those women to run mom and baby groups. Um, and it's a social enterprise. So they charge fees for this. It's run in communities. We're in four provinces. We've got about 150 of them. So again, trying to demonstrate what can be done with committed people. And then we do research because we actually can't track whether we're making progress if we're not measuring it. 
So the South African Demographic Health Survey is fantastic because it gives us a national sense. But if you look at the sample sizes at the provincial level, they're tiny. So what's driving stunting in the winelands could potentially be very different where you've got high burdens of fetal alcohol syndrome to what's driving stunting in Lumpopo where people don't have good water and sanitation. And so if we're gonna use our limited resources, we need to know exactly what we're trying to fix in this community, which might be quite different to a community that's got avocados and mopani worms, which are amazing in terms of a protein rich food and can be added to porridge and are fantastic for babies to an urban and formal um, you know, setting where people can't grow anything where my parents are working the whole day, we're shown on ECD centers that only feed up from breakfast to, to dinner time. So, so that's another thing we do is doing surveys and studies door to door, household to household, trying to map what is driving stunting in particular communities. And then just, you know, creating awareness because I think, you know, once, the, once us as South Africans start to demand this as something that we want our political leaders to change, then it strengthens all of this. And we'll start to see things moving very quickly. But unfortunately, you know, this is not, I mean, even for myself, you know, before I was in this role, I knew about stunting, you know, as a medic really, but I didn't realize the sort of public health and economic impact of it. So really sensitizing South Africans that this is a justice issue. This is not a health condition. This is fueling inequality. And I think as Middle class, middle class South Africans often kind of see these as poverty related issues that don't affect them. But in fact, us as a country, our sort of prosperity, the stability of our country, you know, everybody in South Africa worries about crime. Well, I can tell you when you're shedding thousands of jobs, when you've got lots of angry, unemployed dropouts, young people who can't get a chance in the society, we're gonna live in a very unstable South Africa. And then in terms of our own investment of the future of the country, if we really want to be the South Africa that we know we can be, and um, we need to invest in the foundations for success and stunting is one of those, well, reducing stunting is one of those foundations for success. I think Dr. Mabasa should head up this task force. This national... <laughs> You're the person to lead it, yeah. clearly. Um, I think the engagement on our, on our various platforms is we are quite active there as well. Um, we have a few questions that came through and perhaps I can pose to Dr. Wegere from Dr. Mawasu, you can also uh, join through in the discussion. Um, there's a question here from Guguletu Matlango. Guguletu Matlango is asking, how can farmers contribute um, to ending child stunting? It's quite clear that farmers are even struggling with securing market value and how can we change this? And then she's also asking around food waste. Um, as farmers supply markets food um, that's not appealing or the right size and look for the supermarkets get thrown out and rejected. Why can't this food get to the people who need it and the nutritional value, vegetables and fruits? Um, Dr. Mabasso or Dr. Vekhrev, maybe you can, you can also join here. Let me, let me make a few responses and maybe touch on some of the other things that have been discussed. You know, certainly I think a national task force would be great to have and you know, bring together people, focus just on how do we achieve food security? How do we end stunting? And looking at the food system from that perspective, not looking at you know, how we maximize profits or GDP, which can be nice for some, but looking at the end result we want, which is how do we have a healthy, well-fed nation? And so I think we can do that. And in terms of farmers, uh, uh, playing a role. I think farmers have many roles to play. Of course, producing good quality food. And um, personally, I'm a proponent of agroecological approaches where they work. I know they're not always easy, but whether we take those approaches or not, uh, we need to ensure good quality food is there and at reasonable prices at least. But as I said, farmers need to get a reasonable return because the other big contribution farmers make is through employment. And the, the more people we can have employed but also I mean for me I would prefer to see more people with their own farms with their own businesses what we need in South Africa is not just employment we need ownership opportunities we need pe more people having a greater stake in this economy um, and I think you know many more small farmers and the small farmers we already have as I said there are actually millions of them um, they, they do and they can make a contribution they can make a much greater contribution especially in that employment and, and income earning. And I think related to another point I saw in the, in the chat line, 
when you and this relates also to the waste point that Google Letter was raising, I think. I think with, when you have local markets and selling, you can reduce quite a bit of that waste. And certainly when you have local street traders, there's less sensitivity to whether the banana is exactly the right shape or color, et cetera. And, and you know, which is a big issue in the supermarkets. And so they're more selling affordable food to people. And some, I'm not saying the quality is worse. And often the quality is actually even better in the street. Um, but I'm saying they're also not applying some of those um, kind of more visual uh, marketing related kind of dynamics. And the other thing that happens is that when the street trader's food, he knows it's now getting older, he's, he or she reduces the price to move it quickly. Already, you know, the, the, where the supermarkets are less uh, nimble in doing that. Um, and that can, so they, they, so what I'm saying is that farmers linked to local food systems and street traders, I think is one option. And one of the things that, which relates to the point someone raised on pricing going up, I've just been amazed in some of the research we're doing at the price difference between what is sold by street traders in places like Johannesburg and, and so on, and what you get in the supermarket. I mean, just for an example, this is figures from last month, when we go to a street trader, and they're selling cabbage and you know at well just under five rand a kilo they were selling the cabbage and the supermarkets more than 10 rand a kilo that's twice the price on cabbage which we know is affordable food for many people onions which are used all the time we got street traders selling onions at <clears throat> well nine rand 20 a kilo and in the supermarket it was 15 rand 162 percent more expensive and you go to something like the robot uh you know the nice which is which is nice and healthy food and it's affordable in the street when you can buy for five rand, eight rand, you can buy your robot and you're paying 12 rand, in this case, 12 rand 60 per kilo and the supermarket 63 rand 30 a kilo on the same day. That's five times the price in the supermarket. So, I mean, I, so I know where the increased prices in the supermarket value is going because often those things are coming from the same Johannesburg fresh produce market. And you know, I'm paying five times the price literally in the supermarket. So that's going in profits, it's going, you know, uh, but it's not helping farmers and it's not helping the consumer. So I do think there's a lot of value we can get with smaller farmers who create much more employment linked to smaller uh, traders and so on. Uh, did I answer all the questions? Yes, yes, you did, you did beautifully. Well. Um, but um, the yeah, other I, thing with small farms and waste is, is when you, you have a link and you have a, a circular economy and the local trader, you know, has their waste going back into compost for local agriculture as well. So those was, links are very, are very important to look for. Then, then it's not waste anymore. It's going yeah. back into the soil at the end of the day. And that's, that's important. Course, Mark, I was, I was just going to bring up the, the, the importance of regenerative agriculture and the local economies, but that's a separate discussion all on its own. Francois, you look like you want to add to what Mark was saying. No, I, I just wanted to say, I think, I think what we shouldn't do is to sort of say, well, what we don't need is the large retailers and sophisticated systems. We need all of the above. But what we need to really take into account is that right now we're neglecting the small traders, we're neglecting the small farmers, we're neglecting uh, the whole issue of child stunting as a national priority. It should be, you know, for me, I feel ashamed that it's not, uh, and, and I, I feel ashamed for myself that I've only recently come to this realization that this is a, such a massive problem. And, you know, I, how did I miss this? It, it it's not it's not That's right it. that we miss these things yeah so if I'm, certainly i'm not saying like get rid of them certainly not overnight you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know they, they may be in the longer term but but it's also the regulation because why do they have a dominant position and and the competition commission did a very thorough investigation of the grocery sector and they found extremely anti-competitive practices and where the supermarkets because the mall developers need an anchor supermarket, the supermarkets use that to negotiate exclusive agreements that first of all, give them lower per meter floor space. That means they're getting, they're paying less per meter for the floor space, but it also means that the supermarket developer has to pass on that reduction in income to other shops. So they actually start charging more to the other shops. But many of the supermarkets also insist on an exclusivity agreement where they do not allow another grocery store to operate in the same mall. 
So we're all fed into the mall with transports and so on, and the advertising said, this is where we've got to go. And the supermarkets are locking out other competition, you know, and, and which, so that sort of practice surely has to end. And one, one of my suggestions also, a simple thing we could be doing for the food system would be that we have to make available much more public market space in all of our areas. That creates income earning opportunities for people, and it also makes food more uh, locally accessible because super the mall is also not accessible option for many people because of transport costs etc so many countries have these kind of regulations you know china has a very good uh, crawling peg policy they implement in many cities where per uh, thousand or so of the population i can't remember the exact number there must be a certain amount of square meters of public market space and 90 percent of that public market space must be reserved for small scale food sellers. So it can't also just become imported Chinese toys and stuff. You know, so what that's doing is it's putting fresh produce in walking distance of everyone, even in big cities. And that is a, that's income and business opportunities for local entrepreneurs. And they link more effectively with local small farmers um, because of their scale is a similar scale of operation. So we, we, there's a lot we can do in our urban and town planning to create space for food businesses that make food more accessible. And that's making the food more accessible for the eater of the food. And it's making the market more accessible for smaller scale farmers who can link to those markets. Yeah. You know, every that time I listen to you, it seems to me there's a lot that can be done. And, and increasingly my worry in this conversation has been <laughs> how little is being done. <laughs> and and I, uh, either how do we, how do we, galvanize the nation say, yeah. that's 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 a very good question and if we're looking at what's happening um in terms of our economy where are we going to find the money to 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 create this national task force to to curb um child stunting dawn yeah no definitely i think dr weffer have mentioned some of the solutions but if we can maybe steer the conversation towards that um as as, as we sort of wrap up today's session. Um, Dr. Mabasu, how do we eradicate child stunting? And great, Grow Great has a, basically a lot of great initiatives and plans around it, but what are some of the practical and cost-effective steps to do this? Uh, maybe you can share some of that. Sure. So, I mean, I think, I mean, I think Mark said it at the beginning, and I might have said it as well, that there isn't a, a silver bullet but they certainly are examples. And I think we often have a South African exceptionalism where we sort of, you know, there's lots of our neighboring countries who have done this brilliantly without massive budgets, right? Because they didn't have massive budgets to do this, but they decided that this was an important enough issue. And I think we're often just, yeah, they, we, we need to put our heads down and actually focus on this because it is, it is the foundation for a lot of all the other things we want to achieve as a country. So they aren't silver bullets, but they are things that have worked. And as I said, we have a workforce of 70,000 community healthcare workers who could be better supported. That's an existing workforce. Those are people already in communities. We have a wonderful social security um, basket that protects poor and vulnerable people, but we've missed a trick. We've left out nine months, and I would argue one of the most critical nine months. And I think that needs to be re-looked re at. Um, there's also just great innovations that have come from other countries. So I was thinking with the earlier question, I think it was Google Letters question around, you know, what can I do, right? And, and I think sometimes these, these, these problems, people check out because we're sort of numb. I mean, there's so many crises in South Africa. It just, it's an, you know, it's another crisis and it's quite overwhelming. But there's a lot that we could do at individual level. So Ecuador gave children six to 12 months an egg a day. Now eggs are like almost a perfect protein. They're full of choline, which is amazing for brain development. They ran this in a study, they're affordable. They can be mixed with porridge. So a lot of our babies are transitioned onto porridges all day, every day, which is macronutrient rich, keeps them full and actually they sleep pretty well, but micronutrient poor. So there's a hidden hunger, you know, that, that's, that's happening here. So they added eggs, who would have thought? And they reduce stunting in this group of children that they follow by 42%, right? So we're repeating this. I mean, it's unbelievable. So Gates Foundation, everybody's like, what? So studies have been run around in different parts of the country. We're doing one at the Northwest, but those are some simple things. And we've actually seen some, pulp, some, some farmers you know, come, come alongside us and donate eggs to activations. Um, and it's been incredible because eggs are considered sustainable. 
the Shabbos meat in family. So when a family is, is poor, you eat pup and eggs. Dad eats pup and eggs. You're not going to waste eggs on babies. But if it was understood that this is the farm, this is a gift you're giving to your pregnant woman. So likewise, India's done a study where they were giving eggs to pregnant women. Likewise, that's an incredible simple thing that you can do if you're a poultry farmer and donate to your local ECD center. Because I can guarantee you, there those babies are eating eggs for breakfast and lunch at least. And just adding an egg to porridge makes a huge difference. So there's really practical things we can do. We can also push in a health system just to measure it. So in health facilities, we weigh babies, but we don't routinely measure their height because we want the chubby baby, the shiny, puffy, round baby. But in fact, that baby is also malnourished because obesity is a form of um, malnutrition. And in fact, we're seeing in South Africa a double burden of malnutrition where you have a short, stunted and round baby. And that might look really cute, but that baby is not a healthy baby. So, you know, because food that is nutritious, that's micronutrient dense is expensive, these babies are fed porridge, fed porridge early, are big, but are not healthy. So if we were measuring, if we were tracking at facility level, and, and, and if you open those clinic cards, you often find that page empty. So it's in there, but healthcare workers are not measuring these, these, these babies, not measuring their height, because it's not tracked at national level. So they'll only measure what gets aggregated into what we call the district health information system, which is what we use to track progress. So there's simple things that we can start to do, because then we can pick up hotspots, like the Northern Cape, like Gauteng, which comes up in the demographic health survey as having the highest level of stunting in South Africa, but because the, the, the sample size is so small, nobody's convinced that if we're routinely tracking data, we, we then know where we're making progress and where we need to quickly direct resources, because that's where um, the big gaps lie. So I think there's a whole bunch of stuff that we can do already. And then there's the structural issues, right? So I mean, you know, we have one, one in three women in South Africa um, suffer from perinatal depression. And there's a huge body of evidence showing the connection between antenatal or postnatal depression and poor birth outcomes, both in terms of the baby's birth weight, in terms of their head circumference, but also even cognitive development. And this is something that can be easily screened at health facilities, but also something we as society need to be supporting um, our sisters, our aunts, our neighbors with, right? So there's, there's, there's a piece of this project for everyone. And, and you can pick your piece. It can be the food system. It can be the health workforce. It can be the data. It can be me as a farmer making, deciding that I'm going to donate a tray of eggs to this EC, this crash down the road, you know, once a month. And that's, that will literally make a huge difference to those kids. Um, so I think Dawn, you know, there's, there's, it's a big project, but I think it's certainly one that's not insurmountable. And I think it's an exciting project because, you know, the prospect of zero stunting is a huge unlocking of, of potential in South Africa that we're just missing currently. Mm. And many of the people participating in this webinar coming forward with, with great solutions. I see many, many tweets also from outside South Africa coming in. Um, there's a message here on Zoom from Zola saying, um, perhaps we're missing another opportunity. She says, governments can use trade in diverse ways to influence the food system, to balance supply and demand for food while avoiding exploitation um, of, of farmers. And she's saying small farmers um, that would make food affordable, available to lower LSM groups. Um, Dr. Wieger, before we start moving the conversation to, to um, you know, creating a national recognition for, for, for child stunting, Dr. Kupano was referencing the last nine months. I loved that description during the pandemic. And we know that COVID-19 was devastating on, on the poor, particularly in South Africa, most parts of the world. How do we recover lost ground from there? And then maybe Dawn, we had afterwards to, to, to Francois with um, some of the national issues there. Dr. Mark? Yeah, well, thank you. And maybe yeah, before we get into solutions, maybe to hammer a few of the, the, the problems we have and the challenges still and causes. Um, and I think one thing that to be very clear about is that we were in a crisis before COVID. We were in an economic crisis of recession and, and not just the recession of the last months. Basically, for the last 10 years, our economy in South Africa per person hasn't been growing, but inequality has been growing. Even when our economy was growing before, with inequality growing, it meant the poorest 50% of the population were staying in poverty, some getting even poorer. And that, of course, also meant uh, increasing hunger. 
So we've seen hunger levels, I mean, in the, the last uh, State of Food Nutrition Security report globally said that more than 51% of South Africans are experiencing at least severe or moderate food insecurity. More than half of our population is food insecure. And again, the really worrying thing about that is that it, that had gone up from 45% in the previous period. So we're going the wrong direction. I said, and food insecure people today means stunted children tomorrow and in the coming years. And so when we're seeing that level increasing, um, you know, and sadly, the prediction would be we're going to see more stunting, you know, higher stunting levels over the coming years. This is before COVID. And partly addressing Zola Brunner's points that she's been raising as well. Um, you know, what's been going wrong in that and part of it in South Africa is inequality and yes I don't think anyone in this panel said there shouldn't be trade including international trade it is the nature of the trade and how it's regulated and who benefits from that so and unfortunately the kind of economic growth where it, limited as it's been in South Africa has not been creating jobs has not been addressing bringing people out of poverty has not been creating greater food security so I was very concerned I listened to you know the last days our, our president has been giving a lot of attention to this investment summit and I happened to listen to the radio this morning and an economic advisor to the president was being interviewed the whole discussion talked about the amounts of investment some mention of GDP there was not a single mention of jobs of equality or inequality and of course no mention of hunger so even some of the investment and there was a lot of attention to what are we going to see a building a structure there and no one says jobs. I mean, I see the buildings in Santon. I cry when I see where my health insurance money has gone, you know, into some shiny uh, office block in, in Santon. That to me is not progress if there's less jobs with that. So it's just frightening that that kind of discussion happens. Yes, I'm not against the investment, but I'm saying we need an investment that creates jobs, creates more economic opportunities, creates more ownership opportunities. And in fact, half the investments go into technology that can even be shedding jobs. That doesn't help us. So that can grow your GDP. It doesn't help most South Africans. So that's where we need a different kind of priority. Now COVID comes along, slows the economy, increases inequality. And if you look closely at Tito Mboweni's uh, medium term expenditure framework, his best case scenario sees our economy smaller in 2023 than it was in 2019 in real terms. You know, that's his best case scenario. We, we are in a crisis. It's definitely a time when the more radical solutions are needed and justified. And that could in, include certain kinds of trade regulation. Again, Zola, I'm not saying no trade. I'm saying, how do we regulate it to benefit the South African economy and South African people? And that's important. How do we regulate the sector so the value capture is not just in some large, mostly foreign owned supermarket groups, but more of it goes to farmers, especially farmers who create jobs and who pass that on in better salaries to workers. And how can that go to new farmers, giving them more opportunity? You know, so that's the sort of thing we need. And yes, and well, I do, I do, do want to touch on Copano's point because part of what we are sold by some of companies and fast food chains is very unhealthy food. The, 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 the obesity problem, which is, as Copano said, a form of malnutrition, is also driven by what's marketed and the, the high salt, high fat content foods that are being sold uh, to people. That is extremely damaging. And people who are spending that money on those foods instead of on fresh vegetables and so on. So we need, that needs education interventions. And it also needs regulatory interventions where we say certain foods that are just really damaging to our health and the health of our children, there should be regulation around it. You know, so the state, and, and with COVID, we have every reason, excuse, and need to intervene on some of these things and say, how do we build back a healthier economy and a healthier society? I just want to shout amen, Don. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely, <laughs> definitely. Been preaching for too long, sorry. <laughs> um, so maybe we can, we can now start talking about how do we bring stunting into the spotlight? Um, how do we bring it to the fore and achieve, nat to achieve national recognition? Uh, Francia, you spoke about it when we started the discussion. Maybe you can touch on that again. Thank you. I, I must say, as, as Dr. Mabasu and Dr. Vieher have talked, I, I felt more and more like that, uh, like that uh, shiny, chubby baby, you know, at my age. I'm becoming more shiny and more chubby <laughs> by the day. I wasn't the shiny, I wasn't the shiny, chubby baby, but I am now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so a little levity 
is not uh, at the expense of the importance and the gravity of this of this problem. And perhaps the issue is that you know, people like me at my age, I discover this problem for the first time now, and I really I I feel terrible about it. And I think the start is to help more people discover this problem. We need to we need to really bring child stunting home to everyone uh, with access to any form of communication, and and we should we should do more of that, all of us. The second thing is what I heard that we already have many plans, but what we don't have is execution. And we need to find a way of forcing execution. And if, if those who are responsible for the execution uh, doesn't do it, well, they need to be replaced. And by which I don't mean a political statement, by which I mean, you know, if necessary, maybe we could get some lawyers to bring a class action suit to force agencies and organizations that's supposed to do things to do what they're supposed to do. But mo most importantly, we need jobs. Everything I've heard today says uh, we need to we need to make sure that people have jobs, and uh, unemployment is directly linked to child stunting. So we know that it's cheaper to save a job than to create a job. Doesn't mean we don't create jobs. It means we have to do both. We have to save the ones we have because they already feed people, and then. Uh, I think there are these important issues of linking food security and food access, helping people to get the right access at the right time. So I think there's sort of a, a seven point plan that's starting to develop here of the most important things we can do. And that could almost be an agenda for the National Task Force. Uh, and uh, Dr. Mabasu made a very important point. We don't need to throw more money at the problem we need to do things <laughs> because poorer countries than South Africa uh, have made more progress than South Africa. Uh, we need to get a little bit of our national competitive spirit into solving the child stunting problem. And that's what I want to propose is that we need a national task force with seven simple things to be done straight away and keep that focus in front of our people uh, at all times. Dr. Wegerif, Dr. Mabasso, as, we, as we're wrapping up today's discussion, um, would you also like to comment on this and how you see, see it playing out? And what is, how do we, how do we make this work by 2030? Um, it's not so long, it's 10 years, but yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, Ma. Sorry, thank yeah. you. Um, absolutely, Dawn. I mean, I think the employment one is, is critical. You know, I mean, we, you know, sometimes we, we can create elaborate programs and sort of um, complex schemes to solve things, but actually people can solve a lot themselves if we give them access to the resources. So many of us who've raised children and had a job didn't go through a fancy counseling session with them. You know, we didn't necessarily have massive interventions. We were just able to have access to some money that allows us, because it's not often that parents don't know that giving you know, spinach and some meat, a little bit of chicken, et cetera, is good for the child. It's that they just can't afford it. And the baby stops crying when you give them up and that's what they can afford. So I think jobs are, is, is gonna definitely take us part way there. But I think we need to think a little bit more innovatively around how we reimagine um, solving unemployment going forward. Because as, as Mark said, you know, COVID, we were ready sort of on the edge, on the precipice, pre-pandemic. And things don't look like they're gonna get much better. And in fact, with the potential second wave and people's resources, the sort of little buffering they have now gone, things can get a whole lot worse. And I mean, the NIDS cram that, that Mark spoke about suggests that child hunger has doubled as a result of the pandemic. So they, they think it's back to sort of the 2008 um, crisis levels, if not higher. So we need to be smart about how we build back. Um, and so, you know, double duty interventions. So, I mean, I mentioned about social enterprising, so social franchising, and we need to think smart around jobs that both address social ills, 
like equipping a workforce with skills for ECD, because we know from the literature that yes, stunting is for the most part, um, casts a long shadow on children's lives, but that if you can mitigate some of the impact through early learning, books, reading, bonding with children, singing, children are resilient. So, I mean, you know, we talk about this one in four, this one in four is walking around on playgrounds on the streets, kicking a ball, we can't write them off. So, you know, so let's, let's think around how we, we, we reinforce the ECD workforce. We've, you know, we're doing um, mom and baby groups. There's lots of social um, innovative types of enterprise that we need to thinking thinking smarter around because a lot of our programs are like cleaning the highway and picking up garbage and that doesn't equip you as the young person with any kind of skill but you're taking some and doesn't really it's not a, a major societal ill you know um and then i think i mean we we pushed for this we literally wrote to almost all the big retailers during lockdown and they all sent us their sincerest regrets but they you know in a crisis we do need to see private sector come to the party so we identified 10 goods of food. So MIC, legumes, tinned pilchards, really basic stuff. And we had nutritionists look at this. That would be a cheap basket of food that if for a period retailers, and, and we suggested the hard lockdown when we knew that people were suffering, could remove markups just for a period <laughs> or even freeze because I think the Peter Maritzburg Economic Justice Group shows that prices have actually, as Mark said, have gone up. So why don't we protect a basket of foods for a period? Like let's let's get corporate South Africa to get behind this as well, because we, I think it's it's you know government has a huge role to play, but private sector can make a difference as well. Um, so I think we probably need another session drawn because there's a lot of ways that we can start shifting the needle, um, but certainly you know there's some some quick wins that we can start implementing and put into the seven point plan. Dr. Mark, um, in, in closing, would you be supportive of a national task force? Um, I love the engagement coming through on all the platforms and, and there certainly is an appetite for it from, from the public tuning into to this webinar. Yeah, certainly, I think it would be great. I mean, we, we need more attention given to this issue. It's, it's something that even, uh, you know, uh, the policy I said adopted in 2013 called for. So we have a government policy that says it should be there. So that's one of the first things that could be implemented um, if we're pushing for implementation. Uh, but 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 we know structures don't solve every problem. So I'm, I, you know, and we know that it can just be more meetings. But I think I'm, I'm encouraged a bit by how the the National AIDS Council, at least when it had the right leadership, combined with the right political support at the highest level, has made a serious difference. So if we have a task force, but we also need to make sure this has got teeth that it has the right kind of support at the highest levels of government and of civil society. So I think we need much more communication around what stunting is and the impacts it has. And we need to keep up that communication. So no one can go through school without knowing it or through university or sit in an economic development discussion without hearing about it. I think we need champions from different sectors who champion this. And this has been worked on internationally where there's certain international champions. I think we can do more to have champions in South Africa that profile this issue. I love all the sort of suggestions from and practical interventions that Kokwano is talking about and that she's also driving and doing. So I think we should push those. And of course, I'm gonna still argue that we need this um, wider food system approach. And that's where I get uh, you know, a bit cautious about some of the corporate involvement because there are very strong vested interests. There are profits. And these companies, even where they do a little bit of good here and there, you know, and I've been in the discussions with them, I've been in the, at the table with them, and you get to a certain point where it says, well, we have, to, we have to serve our shareholders. At the end of the day, we have to get returns to our shareholders. And that tends to override some of the real serious changes we need. Um, but, you know, I'm just raising that as a caution. And then the government um, obviously needs to come to the party, but they, and, and, and as I said, I, it's encouraging some things do work. The NSNP does actually largely seem to work. Let's like celebrate some of that and say we could extend that. It's possible, you know, in the sort of all the good reasons we have to criticize the government. Um, but also they don't seem to even promote some of the good things they do do very well. But then that's where I tie those interventions to food system change. We're spending 7 billion rand a year on food as the government for our children. Now that, and we know at the beginning of the year, how much we need, what vegetables, what fruit we need. Why are we not sitting down with our black farmers and saying at the beginning of the year, 
what can you deliver? I mean, it's a secure market that you know could work. So, so again, we can link up some of these dots and we can create greater sort of value and benefit uh, out of them. But we're going to need change. Uh, I think we've got to start with building on what people are already doing. Build on what street traders are doing to create jobs for themselves and make food available. Build on those black farmers that are succeeding instead of having debates about whether everyone wants to farm or not. Of course not everyone wants to farm. Of course not. But support those who do and who are farming. And I just find it amazing that I sit with black farmers and they're all normally smaller scale. I remember one woman farmer in Pumalanga and I said small farmer and she said I'm not a small farmer I've got 22 hectares you know and respect to her she farms and she sells to supermarkets she sells to others but the, the perspective to me was interesting. The thing about her and so many other farmers I talked to that's interesting is that she's got no assistance from government. When she tries to get assistance it doesn't somehow fit with her. So we have government programs that miss those farmers who are working and succeeding. We've got to bring that together. So definitely build on what people are already doing. We can learn from internet, including movements, food sovereignty campaign, and others that are pushing for changes in our food system and international initiatives. Next year, there's a UN summit on, on food systems. And because they've realized at that great level that we have to take this food system approach. So that is a big event for next year. Let's contribute to that and let's bring learnings from that back to South Africa as well. Um, so yeah, we need many approaches and we need to generate more energy around it and certainly communicating more on it and getting some champions would be somewhere to start. We cannot, we cannot close off today's discussion without getting a last comment from you, Francois, and then um, we'll, we'll wrap up. <laughs> so my, my first comment on the last comment is Dr. Mabasu for chairing the National Task Force. <laughs> But equally serious, we need to be inclusive. We need to take everyone along with us. Uh, and I think Mark makes this point, Dr. Vyacharev makes this point very well, to say it's not necessary to exclude uh, certain farmers. Uh, it's not necessary to exclude the private sector, but it's also necessary to include those who are currently not included. And for me, uh, this whole thing is to say, let's get a national focus. Let's do all the practical things that Dr. Mabasu has outlined so beautifully that can be done today, not even tomorrow. We can start those things today. But also let's address the systemic problems that Dr. Vyacharev has outlined so cogently. Uh, and by taking the urgent steps today, the necessary steps tomorrow and working together in the national task force, we can end child stunting. And I believe that from Fair Play's perspective uh, and everyone's perspective, this is what we are trying to get done today. And perhaps we should all call for that tomorrow on World Children's Day, uh, is that that could be the, the platform from which to launch this effort. I think there's a very clear call to action there from Francia. Um, and that definitely on that note, uh, we will wrapping up today's session. Um, it's been really fascinating um, learning and understanding child stunting in South Africa um, more clearly. Um, it has definitely been an eye opener for me and many of the people that have been engaging with us today. I'm looking forward to taking action in this regard. And also I think in South Africa, we have this nasty habit um, of creating great policies, but it doesn't always, we don't always see it through and, and, and action it. So, so it's time for action now. And we do owe it to the children of this country. And I'm sure Dawn that the people participating in this webinar from all over the country um, are ready for action. We owe it to um, the children of this country. We simply cannot allow that 27% of our nation's um, children are stunted. Thanks for um, attending this webinar. I see at the moment on Food Forms Zanzi's page, more than 200 people um, watching this live stream um, on Food Forms Zanzi's website alone. And I know people are coming from all sorts of places, Facebook, um, Twitter, um, you name it, um, from both Fair Play and Food Forms Zanzi. So thank you for taking an hour of your time um, um, for this important um, issue. Francois Bird, the founder of the Fair Play Movement. Fascinating, love your insight and looking forward to action, Francois.
<laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Dr. Thank Kapano you. Mabasa, the Executive Director of the Grow Great Campaign. Thank you, Kapano. What an honor. Thank you, Ivor and Dawn. Yeah, wonderful discussion. I do hope we can take some of what we've discussed here forward. Dr. Mark Vecherov, I'm a big fan of the circular economy, so I really enjoyed your contribution as well. He's a lecturer in development studies at the University of Pretoria. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for having me. Thanks for all the participants joining in and listening. Stay tuned to Food for Mzansi for coverage um, about this event, this webinar, and most certainly about news about further developments, because there will be action. All the best. Have a great day further.